Section zero of Pantrophian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrophian by Alexis Sawyer. Pantrophian. Quote, I did feast with Caesar. End quote. Shakespeare from Julius Caesar, Act three, scene three. Quote, Dis-moi ce que tu manges, je te dirai ce que tu es. End quote. Ria Savarin, Physiologie du Goût. Thanks to the impressions received in boyhood, Rome and Athens always present themselves to our minds accompanied by the din of arms, shouts of victory, or the clamours of plebeians crowded round the popular tribune. And yet, said we, nations like individuals have two modes of existence distinctly marked one intellectual and moral the other sensual and physical and both continue to interest through the lapse of ages what for instance calls forth our sympathies more surely than to follow from the cradle that city of romulus at first so weak so obscure and so despised through its prodigious developments until having become the sovereign mistress of the world it seems like alexander to lament that the limits of the globe restrict within so narrow a compass its ungovernable ardour for conquest its insatiable thirst of opimus folia and tyrannical oppression in like manner a mighty river accounted as nothing at its source where a child can step across receives in its meanderous descent the tribute of waters which roll on with increasing violence and rush at last from their too narrow bed to inundate distant plains and spread desolation and terror history has not failed to record one by one the battles victories and defeats of nations which no longer exist and has described their public life their life in open air the tumultuous assemblies of the forum the fury of the populace the revolts of the camps the barbarous spectacles of those amphitheatres where the whole pagan universe engaged in bloody conflict where gladiators were condemned to slaughter one another for the pastime of the over-pampered inhabitants of the eternal city sanguinary spectacles which often consigned twenty or thirty thousand men to the jaws of death in the space of thirty days but after all neither heroes soldiers nor people can be always at war they cannot be incessantly at daggers drawn on account of some open-air election the applause bestowed on a skilful and courageous bestiarius is not eternal captives may be poignarded in the circus by way of amusement but only for a time independently of all these things there is the home the fireside the prose of life if you will nay let us say it at once the business of life eating and drinking it is to that we have devoted our vigils and in order to arrive at our aim we have given an historical sketch of the vegetable and animal alimentation of man from the earliest ages therefore it will be easily understood why we have taken the liberty of saying to the austere jew the voluptuous athenian the obsequious or vainglorious senator of imperial rome and even to the fantastical prodigal and cruel caesars tell me what thou eatest and i will tell thee who thou art but it must be confessed that our task was surrounded with difficulties and required much laborious patience and obstinate perseverance it is easy to penetrate into the temples the baths and the theatres of the ancients not so to rummage their cellars pantries and kitchens and study the delicate magnificence of their dining-rooms now it was there and there alone that we sought to obtain access with that view we have had recourse to the only possible means we have interrogated those old memoirs of an extinct civilization which connect the present with the past poets orators historians philosophers epistolographers writers on husbandry and even those who are the most frivolous or the most obscure we have consulted all examined all neglected nothing 
our respectful curiosity has often emboldened us to peep into the sacred treasure of the annals of the people of god and sometimes the doctors of the primitive church have furnished us with interesting traits of manners and customs together with chance indications of domestic usages disseminated and as it were lost in the midst of grave moral instruction the fatigue of these unwanted researches appeared to us to be fully compensated by the joy we experienced on finding our hopes satisfied by some new discovery like the botanist who forgets his lassitude at the unexpected sight of a desired plant we no longer remembered the dust of fatidical volumes nor the numberless leaves we had turned over when by a happy chance our gastronomic enthusiasm espied a curious and rare dish thus it is that this work essay we ought to call it has been slowly and gradually augmented with the spoils of numerous writers of antiquity both religious and profane we have avoided as much as possible giving to this book a didactic and magisterial character which would have ill accorded with the apparent lightness of the subject and might have rendered it tedious to most readers we know not whether these researches will be considered instructive but we hope they will amuse when we compare the cookery of the ancients with our own and the parallel naturally presents itself to the mind it often betrays strange anomalies monstrous differences singular perversions of taste and incomprehensible amalgamations which baffle every attempt at justification apicius himself or perhaps the coelius of the third century to whom we owe the celebrated treatise de opionius would run great risk if he were now to rise from his tomb and attempted to give vogue to his ten books of recipes either of passing for a prisoner or of being put under restraint as a subject decidedly insane it follows then that although we have borrowed his curious lucubations we leave to the roman epicurean and to his times the entire responsibility of his work the reader will also remark in the course of this volume asserted facts of a striking oddity certain valuations which appear to be exaggerated some descriptions he will pronounce fabulous or impossible now we have never failed to give our authorities but we are far from being willing to add our personal guarantee so that we leave all those antique frauds if any to be placed to the account of the writers who have traitorously furnished them we think however that most persons will peruse with some interest and let us hope a little indulgence these studies on an art which like all arts invented by necessity or inspired by pleasure has kept pace with the genius of nations and become more refined and more perfect in proportion as they themselves became more polite it appears that the luxury and enchantments of the table were first appreciated by the assyrians and persians those voluptuous asiatics who by reason of the enervating mildness of the climate were powerless to resist sensual seductions greece beloved daughter of the gods speedily embellished the culinary art with all the exquisite delicacy of her poetic genius the people of athens says an amiable writer whom we regret to quote from memory took delight in exercising their creative power in giving existence to new arts in enlarging the aureola of civilization at their voice the gods hastened to inhabit the antique oak they disported in the fountains and the streams they dispersed themselves in gamesome groups on the tops of mountains and in the shade of the valleys while their songs and their balmy breath mingled with the harmonious whisperings of the gentle breeze what cooks what a table what guests in that eden of paganism that land of intoxicating perfumes of generous wines and inexhaustible laughter the lacedaemonians alone those cynics of greece threw a saddening shade over the delicious picture of present happiness undisturbed by any thought of to-morrow let us not forget that an athenian not less witty than nice and moreover a man of good company has left us this profound aphorism la viande la plus delicate est celle qui est le moins viande le poisson le plus équis 
et celui qui est le moins poisson rome was long renowned for her austere frugality and it is remarked that during more than five centuries the art of making bread was there unknown which says little for her civilization and intelligence subsequently the conquest of greece the spoils of the subjugated world the prodigious refinements of the syracusians gave to the conquered nations says juvenal a complete revenge on their conquerors the unheard-of excesses of the table swallowed up patrimonies which seemed to be inexhaustible and illustrious dissipators obtained a durable but sad renown the romans had whimsical tastes since they dared not serve the flesh of asses and dogs and ruined themselves to fatten snails but after all the caprices of fashion rather than the refinement of sensuality compelled them to adopt these strange aliments paulus aemilius no doubt a good judge of such matters formed a high opinion of the elegance displayed by his compatriots in the entertainments and he compared a skilful cook at the moment when he is planning and arranging a repast to a great general we were very anxious to enrich our pantrophian with a greater number of bills of fare or details of banquets but we have become persuaded that it is very difficult at the present day to procure a complete and accurate account of the arrangement of feasts at which were seated guests who died two or three thousand years ago save and except the indications more or less satisfactory but always somewhat vague which we gather on this subject from petronius athenaeus apuleius macrobius suetonius and some other writers we can do little more than establish analogies make deductions and reconstruct the entire edifice of an antique banquet by the help of a few data valuable without doubt but almost always incomplete one single passage in macrobius a curious monument of roman cookery will supply the place of multiplied researches it is the description of a supper given by the pontiff lentulus on the day of his reception we present it to the amateurs of the magiric art Quote, the first course anticoina was composed of sea hedgehogs raw oysters in abundance all sorts of shellfish and asparagus the second service comprised a fine fatted pullet a fresh dish of oysters and other shellfish different kinds of dates univalvular shellfish as whelks conchs etc more oysters but of different kinds sea nettles becaficos chines of roebuck and wild boar fowls covered with a perfumed paste a second dish of shellfish and purples a very costly kind of crustacea the third and last course presented several hors d'oeuvres a wild boar's head fish a second set of hors d'oeuvres ducks potted river fish leverets roast fowls and cakes from the marshes of ancona end quote. all these delicacies would very much surprise an epicurean of the present day particularly if they were offered to him in the order indicated by macrobius the text of that writer as it is handed down to us may be imperfect or mutilated again he may have described the supper of lentulus from memory regardless of the order prescribed for those punctilious and learned transitions to which a feast owes all its value let us we would say in addressing our culinary colleagues avoid those deplorable lacunes let us preserve for future generations who may be curious concerning our gastronomic pomp the minutiae of our memorable magiric meetings prompted almost without exception by some highly civilized idea a love of the arts the commercial propagandism or a feeling of philanthropy the greeks and romans egotists if there ever were any supped for themselves and lived only to sup our pleasures are ennobled by views more useful and more elevated we often dine for the poor and we sometimes dance for the afflicted the widow and the orphan moreover a most important ethnographical consideration seems to give a serious interest to the diet of a people if it be true as we are convinced it is and as we shall probably one day endeavour to demonstrate that the manners of individuals their idiosyncrasies inclinations and intellectual habits 
are modified to a certain extent as taste climate and circumstances may determine the nature of their food an assertion which might be supported by irrefragable proofs and would show the justness of the aphorism tell me what thou eatest and i will tell thee who thou art End of introduction. Section one of Pantrophian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrophian by Alexis Sawyer. Agriculture every nation has attributed the origin of agriculture to some beneficent deity the egyptians bestowed this honour on osiris the greeks on ceres and triptolemus the latins on saturn or on their king janus whom in gratitude they placed among the gods all nations however agree that whoever introduced among them this happy and beneficial discovery has been most useful to man by elevating his mind to a state of sociability and civilization many learned men have made laborious researches in order to discover not only the name of the inventor of agriculture but the country and the century in which he lived some however have failed in their inquiry but why because they have forgotten in their investigation the only book which could give them positive information on the birth of society and the first development of human industry we read in the book of genesis that the lord god took the man and put him into the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it and after having related his fatal disobedience the sacred historian adds therefore the lord god sent him forth from the garden of eden to till the ground from whence he was taken would it be possible to adduce a more ancient and sublime authority if it be asked why we take moses as our guide instead of dating the origin of human society from those remote periods which are lost in the night of ages we invoke one of the most worthy masters of human science the illustrious cuvier who says quote, no western nation can produce an uninterrupted chronology of more than three thousand years not one of them has any record of connected facts which bears the stamp of probability anterior to that time nor even for two or three centuries after the greeks acknowledge that they learned the art of writing from the phoenicians thirty or thirty-four centuries ago and for a long time after that period their history is filled with fables in which they only go back three hundred years to establish the cradle of their existence as a nation of the history of western asia we have only a few contradictory extracts which embrace in an unconnected form about twenty centuries the first profane historian with whom we are acquainted by works extant is herodotus and his antiquity does not reach two thousand three hundred years the historians consulted by him had written less than a century previous and we are enabled to judge what kind of historians they were by the extravagances handed down to us as extracts from aristaeus proconesus and some others before them they had only poets and homer the master and eternal model of the west lived only two thousand seven hundred or two thousand eight hundred years ago one single nation has transmitted to us annals written in prose before the time of cyrus it is the jewish nation that part of the old testament called the pentateuch has existed in its present form at least ever since the schism of jeroboam as the samaritans received it equally with the jews that is to say that it has assuredly existed more than two thousand eight hundred years there is no reason for not attributing the book of genesis to moses which would carry us back five hundred years more or thirty-three centuries and it is only necessary to read it in order to perceive that it is in part a compilation of fragments from antecedent works wherefore no one can have the least doubt of its being the oldest book now possessed by the western nations the descendants of our first parents 
and first of all the hebrew people who as a nation historically considered must occupy our foremost attention devoted all their energy to agricultural labor the chief of the tribe of judah as well as the youngest son of the tribe of benjamin followed the plough and gathered corn in the fields gideon was thrashing and winnowing his corn when an angel revealed to him that he should be the deliverer of israel ruth was gleaning when boaz saw her for the first time king saul was driving his team of oxen in the ploughed field when some of his court came and apprised him that the city of jabesh was in danger and elisha was called away to prophesy while at work with one of his father's ploughs we could multiply these incidents without end to prove what extraordinary interest the jews took in agricultural occupations moses regarded agriculture as the first of all arts and he enjoined the hebrews to apply themselves to it in preference to any other it was to the free and pure air of the fields to the strengthening healthy and laborious country life that he called their first attention the sages of greece and rome held the same opinion in those republics the tradesman was but an obscure individual while the tiller of the soil was considered as a distinguished citizen the urban tribes yielded precedence to the rustics and this latter class supplied the nation with its generals and its magistrates our present ideas on this point have materially changed with the times and our modern cincinnati very seldom return to the field to terminate the furrow they have commenced the israelites did not possess this excessive delicacy they preserved the taste for agriculture with which their great legislator moses had inspired them and which the distribution of land naturally tended to strengthen no one in fact was allowed to possess enough ground to tempt him to neglect the smallest portion nor had any one the right to dispossess the hebrew of his father's field even he himself was forbidden to alienate for ever land from his family this wise disposition did not escape the notice of an ancient heathen author and various states of greece adopted the same plan amongst others the locrians athenians and spartans who did not allow their father's inheritance to be sold the plan which we have adopted for our guidance in this work hardly justifies us in casting more than a glance at the mosaic legislation we shall therefore pass over all those prescriptions all those memorable prohibitions which the reader must have so often admired in the books of leviticus and deuteronomy and content ourselves with observing that moses knew how to find in agriculture an infallible means of developing the industry of his people and that by imposing the necessity of giving rest to the land every seventh year he obliged them by the generality of this repose to have stores in reserve and consequently to employ every means of preserving portions of the grain fruit wines and oil which they had gathered in the course of the six years preceding ancient casuists of this nation enter into the most minute details on tillage and sowing and also on the gathering of olives on the tithes which were paid to the priests and the portion set aside for the poor they also mention some species of excellent wheat barley rice figs dates etc which were gathered in judea the soil of this delicious country was astonishingly fertile the operation tillage was easy and the cattle here supplied a greater abundance of milk than anywhere else we will just remark that even the names of several localities indicate some of these advantages for instance capernaum signified a beautiful country town genesareth the garden of the groves bethsida the house of plenty nam was indebted for its sweet name to the beauty of the situation and magdala on the borders of the sea of galilee to its site and the happy life of its inhabitants next to the hebrews in agriculture came the egyptians a strange and fantastical people who raised the imperishable pyramids the statue of memon and the lighthouse of alexandria and yet who prayed religiously every morning to their goddess a radish or their gods leek and onion whatever they may be of folly and rare industry in this mixture we cannot but agree that the art of agriculture was very ancient in egypt 
as the father of the faithful abraham retired into that country at a time of famine and later the sons of jacob went there also to purchase corn we know that the romans called this province the granary of the empire and that they drew from it every year twenty million bushels of corn if we are to believe the egyptians osiris son of jupiter and hence a demigod of good family taught them the art of tilling the ground by aid of the plough the instrument we may easily believe was much less complicated than ours of the present day there is no doubt that in the beginning and for a great length of time afterwards it was nothing but a long piece of wood without joint and bent in such manner that one end went into the ground whilst the other served to yoke the oxen for it was always these animals which drew the plough although homer seems to give the preference to mules the greeks clever imitators of the egyptians pretended that ceres taught them the art of sowing reaping and grinding corn they made her goddess of harvest and applied themselves to the labour of agriculture with that rare and persevering ability which always characterised these people and consequently was often the cause of many things being attributed to them which they only borrowed from other nations the romans future rulers of the world understood from the first that the earth claimed their nursing care and romulus instituted an order of priesthood for no other object than the advancement of this useful art it was composed of the twelve sons of his nurse all invested with sacerdotal character who were commanded to offer to heaven vows and sacrifices in order to obtain an abundant harvest they were called avales brothers one of them dying the king took his place and continued to fulfil his duty for the rest of his life in the palmy days of the republic the conquerors of the universe passed from the army or the senate to their fields serenus was sowing when called to command the roman troops and quintus cincinnatus was ploughing when a deputation came and informed him that he was appointed dictator everything in the conduct of the romans gives evidence of their great veneration for agriculture they called the rich locupletes that is persons who were possessors of a farm or country seat locus their first money was stamped with a sheep or an ox the symbol of abundance they called it pecunia from pecus flock the public treasure was designated pascua because the roman domain consisted at the beginning only of pasturage after the taking of carthage the books of the libraries were distributed to the allied princes of the republic but the senate reserved the twenty-eight books of mago on agriculture we shall briefly point out the principal process of this art in use among the greek and romans or at least those which appear to us most deserving of interest like us the ancients divided the land in furrows whose legal length if we may so term it was one hundred and thirty feet oxen were never allowed to stop while tracing a furrow but on arriving at the end they rested a short time and when their task was over they were cleaned with the greatest care and their mouths washed with wine the ground being well prepared and fit to receive the seed the grain was spread on the even surface of the furrows and then covered over the primitive plough already mentioned was of extreme simplicity it had no wheels but was merely furnished with a handle to enable the ploughman to direct it according to his judgment neither was there any iron or other metal in its construction they afterwards made a plough of two pieces one of a certain length to put the oxen to and the other was shorter to go in the ground it was similar in shape to an anchor such was the style of plough which the greeks used they also very often employed a sort of fork with three or four prongs for the same purpose pliny gives credit to the gauls for the invention of the plough mounted on wheels the anglo-norman plough has no wheels the ploughman guided it with one hand and carried a stick in the other to break the clods the greeks and romans had not perhaps the celebrated guano of our days though we would not positively assert it but they knew of a great variety of manures all well adapted to the various soils they wished to improve sometimes they made use of marl a sort of fat clay 
and frequently manure from pigeons blackbirds and thrushes which were fattened in aviaries for the benefit of roman epicures certain plants they thought required a light layer of ashes which they obtained from roots and brushwood others succeeded best according to their dictum on land where sheep goats etc had grazed for a long time when the harvest season arrived they joyfully prepared to cut the corn with instruments varying in form according to the locality or the fancy of the master in one place they adopted the plain sickle in another that with teeth sometimes they mowed the corn as they did the meadows with a scythe or else they plucked off the ears with a kind of fork armed with five teeth a short time after the harvest the operation of thrashing generally began heavy chariots armed with pointed teeth crushed the ears varro calls this machine the carthaginian chariot strabo asserts that the ancient britons carried the corn into a large covered area or barn where they thrashed it adding that without this precaution the rain and damp would have spoiled the grain at all events this kind of thrashing in barns with flails and sticks was not unknown to other countries pliny speaks of it and columella describes it we may add that the egyptians were also very probably acquainted with this method since the jews who had submitted to their power employed it themselves when the corn had been thrashed winnowed and put into baskets very similar to our own of the present day they immediately studied the best means of preserving it some preferred granaries exposed to a mild temperature others had extensive edifices with thick brick walls without openings except one hole only in the roof to admit light and air the spaniards africans and cappadocians dug deep ditches from which they excluded all moisture they covered the bottom and lined the sides with straw then put in the grain and covered it up the ancients were of opinion that corn in the ear could by this means be preserved a great number of years if it is desirable to keep corn for any length of time choose the finest and best grown after having worked it make a pile as high as the ceiling will permit cover with a layer of quicklime powdered of about three inches thick then with a watering pot moisten this lime which forms a crust with the corn the outside seeds bud and shoot forth a stalk which perishes in winter this stalk is only to be touched when necessity requires it at sedan a warehouse has been seen hewed out of the rock and tolerably damp in which there had been a considerable pile of corn for the last hundred and ten years it was covered with a crust a foot thick on which persons might walk without bending or breaking it in the slightest degree marshal vauban proposed eating corn in soup without being ground it was boiled during two or three hours in water and when the grains had burst a little salt butter or milk was added this food is very nice not unwholesome and might be employed when flour is scarce heated or half rotten Dutour. the chinese instituted a ceremony which had for its base to honour the profession of agriculture every year at the time of ploughing the fields the emperor with all his court paid a visit to his country residence near pekin and then marked out several furrows with his plough in seventeen ninety three the national convention of france instituted a similar fete and the president of the local administration of his county was to mark out a furrow in eighteen forty eight a grand republican procession took place through paris to the champ de mars wherein agriculture played a prominent part the first treatise on agriculture was printed in fifteen thirty eight and its importance has been so much felt from that period that there are now in france more than one hundred and twenty societies of agriculture who distribute prizes to encourage discoveries for the improvement of this science we have in our days the royal agricultural society of england which also awards prizes and through such institutions all information can be obtained on the successive progresses we have made in that indispensable art which may be said to have arrived to such a degree of perfection that future generations may find some difficulty in improving upon it 
one great evidence of which is the immense number of samples of agricultural produce machines and implements of husbandry which great and the glorious exhibition of eighteen fifty one has ushered to the world previous to the arrival of the romans the ancient britons paid but little attention to agriculture their intestine discords left them scarcely any leisure to cultivate their fields or apply themselves to the improvement of an art which flourishes only in peaceful times they reared a great number of cattle but their chief corn was barley of which they made their favourite drink they put the grains in the ear into barns and beat it out as they wanted it those inhabitants of the island who were the least civilised subsisted solely on milk and the flesh of animals which they had learned to master by their skill but the people of this nation for which heaven had in reserve such a brilliant destiny knew how to endure hunger cold and fatigue without a murmur a briton passed entire days immersed to the neck in the stagnant waters of a marsh a few roots sufficed for his nourishment and if we are to believe dio his frugal habits enabled him to appease the craving of his stomach with an aliment composed of ingredients no longer known and of which he took each time at long intervals a quantity not exceeding in size that of a bean let us add that the art of gardening was known rather early in great britain and that marl was employed to manure the land the anglo-saxons employed themselves diligently in the cultivation of the soil they established farms sowed grain and reared cattle the fleece of their sheep furnished them with precious wool which they spun and then converted into sumptuous clothing strutt gives us a curious detail of rural occupations at that epoch we will cite the original text Quote, january exhibits the husbandman in the fields at plough while his attendant diligently following is sowing the grain february the grain being put into the earth the next care was to prune their trees crop their vines and place them in order march then we follow them into the garden where the industrious labourer is digging up the ground and sowing the vegetables for the ensuing season april now taking leave of the laborious husbandman we see the nobleman regaling with his friends and passing the pleasant month in carousings banquetings and music may brings the lord into the field to examine his flock and superintend the shearing of the sheep june with this month comes the gladstone time of harvest here are some cutting down the corn while it is by others bound up in sheaves and laid into the carts to be conveyed to the barns and granaries in the meantime they are spirited up to their labours by the shrill sound of the enlivening horn july we find them employed in lopping the trees and felling of timber etc august in this month they cut down the barley with which they made their old and best beloved drink ale september here we find the lord attended by his huntsmen pursuing and chasing the wild boars in the woods and forests october and here he is amusing himself with the exercise of that old and noble pastime hawking november this month returns us again to the labourers who are here heating and preparing their utensils december in this last month we find them thrashing out the grain while some winnow or rather sift it to free it from the chaff and others carry it out in large baskets to the granaries in the meantime the steward keeps on account of the quantity by means of an indented or notched stick End quote. agriculture was always protected with paternal solicitude by a prince whose name will ever remind us of the sanguinary day of st bartholomew here is a textual passage from the edict issued by charles the ninth the eighteenth of october fifteen seventy one quote, we have commanded and ordained and do hereby command and ordain that no man engaged in the cultivation of land by himself his servants and his families with intent to raise grain and fruit necessary for the sustenance of men and beasts shall be liable to the process of execution for debt nor on any account whatsoever neither in his own person nor his bed horses mares mules asses oxen cows pigs goats sheep poultry ploughs carts 
wagons harrows barrows nor any other species or kind of cattle or goods serving in the said tillage and occupation the said husbandmen being under such protection and safeguard seeing that we have so placed them and do place them by these presents End quote. End of section one. Section two of Pantrophian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophian by Alex Soyer Serials The nomenclature which the Romans have left us of their various kinds of corn is so obscure and uncertain that some modern writers are continually contradicting each other, and by these means have raised doubts which render our task more difficult instead of enlightening us on the subject we shall do all in our power to avoid the censure which we take the liberty of passing upon them triticum wheat or corn ble from the ancient latin word bladus which signifies fruit or seed the botanist michaud has discovered in persia on a mountain four days journey from hamadan the place where wheat a species known as spelt from the latin spelta is indigenous to the soil from which we may presume that wheat has its origin in that country or some part of asia not far from persia this grain was more cultivated formerly than it is now nevertheless it is still gathered in italy switzerland alsac in the limousin and in picardy to make bread with spelt a greater quantity of leaven and above all a little salt this bread is white light savory and keeps moist for several days robus a variety of corn heavier than triticum and remarkable for its brilliant polish every year on the twenty fifth of april an appeal was made to the god robigus to prevent the mildew from corrupting this fine specimen of corn this festival was founded by the great king numa pompilus siligo a beautiful quality of wheat of great whiteness but lighter in weight than the preceding kind trimester a kind of siligo sown in spring and which was ready for reaping three months afterwards granea the grain merely deprived of its cusk it was boiled in water to which milk was added hordium barley the flour of this corn was the food of the jewish soldiers it was with the athenians a favorite dish but among the Romans an ingominous food. Augustus threatened the cohorts that, should they not fight bravely, he would punish every tenth man with death and give the remainder barley for food. This corn was certainly in use among the Egyptians in the time of Moses, since one of the plagues which affected that people was the loss of the barley in the ear before it came to maturity panaceum panic grass certain inhabitants of thrace and of the borders of the exine or black sea preferred this to all other food milium millet was used for making excellent cakes secal rye pliny thinks this grain detestable and only good to appease extreme hunger Avena, oats. Virgil had but very little esteem for this grain. The Romans cut it in the spring for cattle to eat green, and the Germans, in the time of Pliny, took great care in its cultivation, 
and made a pulp of which they thought excellent orza rice pliny and Diochorides class it with the wheats whereas galen on the contrary places it among vegetables rice was rather scarce in greece at the time when theophrastus lived it had lately been brought from india two hundred and eighty six years before christ the ancients considered it most nutritious and fattening z spelt or rice wheat equally esteemed by greeks and latins sesamum sesame pliny classes this among the seeds sown in march and columba places it among the vegetables the romans knew how to prepare this corn in a manner at once wholesome and agreeable they made it into very dainty cakes which were served at dessert went sprang the saying sesame cakes which was applied to those sweet and flattering expressions called honey words in french paroles sucre a people so restless and unimaginable as were the greeks and romans when pressed by hunger required that the greatest care should be exercised for the supply of corn and the easy sale of this precious provision hence nothing could be wiser than their regulations on the subject one of the laws of the twelve tables punished with death the individual who had premeditatedly set fire to his neighbor's corn and inflicted a fine or the whip on any who caused so great a calamity by his imprudence in greece a special magistrate the citocom was charged with the inspection of the corn and various officers such as the citones the citophylaces and the citologes were appointed to watch over its purchase and lastly public distributors under the names of citurches and citometers were exclusively occupied with the allotment of corn they prevented any one from purchasing a greater quantity than was actually necessary for his wants the law forbade the delivery of more than fifty measures to one individual the roman government was so convinced that abundance of bread was one of the best means of maintaining public tranquillity that julius caesar created two praetors and two ediles or magistrates to preside over the purchase conveyance storing and gratuitous distribution of wheat for we know that this people of kings powerful but frivolous and careless of the morrow submitted to the incredible follies of their rulers on the sole condition of being well fed and amused by them in the time of demosthenes the common price of wheat in greece was about three s eleven d the four bushels in rome during the republic wheat was distributed to sixty thousand persons julius caesar desired that thirty two thousand plebeians should enjoy this bounty but this number was afterwards reduced to a hundred and fifty thousand or perhaps according to cassius to a hundred and sixty thousand augustus fed at first two hundred thousand citizens then only a hundred and twenty thousand nero who always went to extremes either in good or evil gave corn throughout the empire to two hundred and twenty thousand idle people including the soldiers of the praetorian guard adrian added to this list all the children of the poor the boys to the age of eighteen and the girls to that of fourteen finally this liberality more politic than generous and so foreign to our present manners was carried under the emperor severus to seventy-five thousand bushels per day the bushel weighted twenty pounds of twelve ounces each the greeks esteemed highly the corn of of botia thrace and pontus 
the romans preferred that of lombardy the present duchy of spoleta sicily sardinia and a part of gaul sardinia sicily and corsica supplied them every year with eight hundred thousand bushels of twenty-one pounds weight which made them call those islands the sweet nurses of rome africa furnished forty million of bushels egypt twenty million and the remainder came from greece asia syria gaul and spain the erudite are not agreed as to the aboriginal country of corn some say it is egypt others tartary and the learned bailey as well as the traveller pallas affirm that it grows spontaneously in siberia be that as it may the phoenicians brought it to marseilles before the romans had penetrated into gaul the gauls ate the corn cooked or bruised it in a mortar they did not know for a long time how to make fermented bread the chinese attribute to chin nong the second of the nine empires of china who preceded the establishment of the dynasties more than two thousand two hundred and seven years b c the discovery of corn rice and other cereals we find in the black book of the exchequer that in the reign of henry the first when they reduced the victuals for the king's household to the estimate of money a measure of wheat to make bread for the service of one hundred men one day was valued only at one shilling but in the reign of henry the third about the forty-third year the price was mounted up to fifteen and twenty shillings a quarter the ancients as well as the moderns caused wheat to undergo certain preparations to enable it to be transformed into bread we shall enumerate in the following chapter the different processes by which they obtained flour the essential foundation of the food of man cereals this name has been given to all plants of the gramius family the fundamental base of the food of man the cereals properly speaking are limited to wheat rye barley and oats however there are others such as canary grass indian corn millet rice and etc the immediate and most abundant principle of all these plants is the fecule or flour and the vegeo animal matter of which bread is made and other preparations for food and fermented liquors these cereals are given green or dry to cattle as forage their straw covers houses and serves as litter and manure cereals was also the name given to a feast in honor of ceres instituted at rome by the edile mamonius and celebrated every year on the seventh of april the ladies of rome appeared clothed in white and holding torches in remembrance of the travels of that divinity cakes sprinkled with salt and grains of incense honey milk and wine were offered to that goddess pigs were sacrificed to her the cereals of the romans were the thesmorphories with the greeks end of section two recording by linda marie nielsen Vancouver, B.C. Section 3 of Pantrophian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrophian by Alexis Sawyer. Grinding of Corn at a very distant period when gods not over edifying in their conduct descended at times from the heights of olympus to enliven their immortality amongst mortals we are told that a divine aliment charmed the palate of jupiter and that of his quarrelsome wife nay of all those who inhabited the celestial abode 
we are ignorant of the hour at which the table of the god of thunder was laid but we know well that he breakfasted dined and supped on a delicious ambrosia a liquid substance it may be presumed since it flowed for the first time from one of the horns of the goat amalthea and of rather an insipid taste if we are to believe ibicus who describes it as nine times sweeter than honey the gods have disappeared we would forgive them for leaving us had they left behind them the recipe of this marvellous substance but its composition and essence remain unknown and man not skilful enough to appropriate to his use the inexhaustible treasures of culinary science began his hard gastrophagic apprenticeship by devouring acorns which grew in the forests this is assuredly very mortifying to our feelings but you may believe it on the authority of a poet for we well know that a poet never tells an untruth besides fabulous antiquity adds new weight to the fact by informing us that the arcadian pelasgus deserved that altars should be erected to his memory for having taught the greeks to choose in preference the beech-nut as the most delicate of this class of comestibles according to the tender virgil who however only judged it by hearsay there is a great degree of probability in the supposition that the different races of the north each inhabiting a country covered with immense forests lived for a long time on the fruit of these different kinds of oak which they possessed in such abundance the great respect they had for the tree the pompous ceremony with which the high priest of the druids came every year to cut away the parasitical plant which clings to it the very name of the druids derived from a celtic word signifying oak all seem to point out the first food of our ancestors the oak furnished the primitive aliment of almost every nation in their original state of barbarism some of them have even preserved a taste for the acorn after they became civilized among the arcadians and the spaniards the acorn was regarded as a delicious article of food we read in pliny that in his time these latter had them served on their tables at dessert after they had been roasted in the wood ashes to soften them according to champier this custom still, still subsisted in spain in the sixteenth century the regulation made by Schrodigon, bishop of metz at the end of the eighth century for the canons says expressly that if in any unfavourable year the acorn or flower should fail it will be the duty of the bishop to provide it when animated by the most praiseworthy zeal and courage du Bellay, bishop of mont came in fifteen forty six to represent to francis i the frightful misery of the provinces and that of his diocese in particular he assured the king that in many localities the people had nothing to eat but bread made of acorns but mankind who soon get tired of everything even of acorns and beech-nuts began to dislike this wholesome and abundant food when ceres the ancient queen of sicily came just a propos to give a few lessons in the art of sowing the earth corn once brought into fashion acquired a surprising repute and the ancient food was given up to the animal which it fattens and if this last were eaten it was no doubt in gratitude for the fruit mankind had formerly so much loved the good series did not stop there it was very well to have corn but to know how to grind it was also requisite and the human race was then so lamentably backward that one might have gone round the world without meeting a miller or even the shadow of the meanest little mill the queen of sicily then invented grinding stones but as the most useful discoveries required time to be known and improved upon the way of grinding corn with stones did not become uniform everywhere the inhabitants of etruria now called tuscany pounded the grain in mortars the early romans adopted the same means and gave the name of pistores grinders to those persons who followed this occupation pliny relates that one of the ancient families of rome took the surname of piso having descended as they believed from the inventor of the art of bruising wheat with pestles down to the latest days of the roman republic the corn was bruised after being roasted 
the pestle used for this purpose was somewhat pointed and suspended by the aid of a ring to the extremity of a flexible lever supported by an axle from the time of moses the hebrews used grinding stones several passages of the holy scripture clearly indicate this among others quote, no man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge for he taketh a man's life to pledge End quote. another text shows that the egyptians used grinding stones with handles at about the same period the israelites when in the desert employed the same means to pound manna and after their settlement in the promised land these utensils served to grind corn the greeks following faithfully the system from which they had but slightly deviated have honoured king miletus as the inventor of grinding stones the upper part was of wood and armed with heads of iron nails a passage of homer would seem to lead us to believe that the grain was first crushed with rollers on stone slabs which operation would naturally lead to the crushing of it between grinding stones however this may be these last were no doubt still scarce in the heroic times since the same poet does not fail to inform us that one was to be seen in the gardens of alcinus chief of the phaeacians this kind of decoration would but very little please the taste of our modern horticulturists nearly two centuries before our era in the year of rome 562 the romans victorious in asia brought with them hand mills this conquest of industry soon made an immense stride and to the labour of man succeeded by degrees the obedient aid of horses and asses hence the two kinds of mills so often mentioned by hand manuales by animal humentario delighted with the discovery which supplied an important necessity of life the romans invented a divinity to whom they might show their gratitude and olympus was honoured with a new inmate the goddess mola protectress and patroness of mills and millstones now mola was one of a large family she had several charming sisters like herself who could not endure living among the commoners while ganymede served ambrosia to their elder sister or poured out for her the nectar of the gods besides it cost so little to be made a goddess a few grains of incense more or less who would grudge such a trifle the flamine of jupiter whom they consulted was at first rather refractory he feared the crowding of olympus he doubted whether polite intercourse could ever be established between gods of high birth and little divinities covered with flour but when at last the high priest had ceased speaking the deputation removed all scruples by a reasonable bribe and the sisters of mola were forthwith enrolled in the list of immortals under the designation of well-beloved daughters of the god of war mars was rather ungentlemanly on the occasion but the high priest undertook to bring him to reason this took place about the end of may and the romans resolved to celebrate from the ninth of the following june the festival of the patroness of roman millers and of her sisters the newly elected divinities the ceremony was worthy of those for whose apotheosis it was instituted and every year on the same day new rejoicings consecrated this great event the mills ceased to turn and to grind a profound silence reigned in the mills the asses patient and indefatigable movers of an incessant rotation took a lively part whether or no in the festivals of which they became the principal actors these honest creatures heads were crowned with roses and necklaces of little leaves encircled their necks and fell gracefully on their chests we need not add that on this day the thick bandages which generally covered the eyes of these useful labourers were removed independently of this annual solemnity the asses turners of the mills had sometimes their windfalls that is to say hours of holiday during which they could freely graze on the neighbouring thistles this happened when an awkward slave performed badly the duties of fanning his master or spilt carelessly a few drops of felernian wine when filling his cup the unfortunate creature was immediately condemned to work at the mill he was deprived of his name and received in lieu that of the quadruped he replaced asinus and the instrument of his sufferings by a refinement of strange irony was called his manger 
it sometimes happened that a free man reduced to extreme indigence had recourse to this hard occupation in order to earn a living plautus was obliged to work at it and we know that he wrote some of his comedies during the short moments of leisure allowed him by his master the miller an important modification was subsequently made in the mechanism of mills we mean hydraulic mills whose introduction into italy is of uncertain date although pomponius sabinus asserts but without proof that this discovery took place in the reign of julius caesar they were known in rome at the time of the emperor augustus and vitruvius mentions them more than sixty years afterwards pliny speaks of them as rare and extraordinary machines some writers have thought that hydroli or hydromili water mills were invented by vitruvius and that this celebrated architect made experiments with them which were forgotten or neglected after his death curious readers who are not afraid of the venerable dust with which time has covered many useful though despised books will consult with benefit the learned treatises of Goetzius on the mills of the ancients printed in the year seventeen thirty strabo who flourished under the emperor augustus tells us a water-mill was to be seen near the town of sabire and the palace mithridates nevertheless this useful invention which we could not now dispense with made so little progress during four centuries that princes thought it a duty to protect by several laws those establishments still rare but which people began to appreciate honorius and arcadius decreed in three ninety eight that any person who turned the water from mills for his own profit should be punished by a fine of five pounds weight in gold and that any magistrate encouraging such an act should pay a like sum the emperor zeno maintained this law and rendered it still more stringent by adding that the edifices or land into which the water had been turned should be confiscated it is to be regretted that the precise origin of the miller's profession cannot be traced but alas in almost all the arts which tend to preserve life we discover the same uncertainty we are ignorant of the period of their discovery and it frequently happens that but few traces of their development remain on the contrary the dates of battles or scourges which have decimated the human race are certain enough the stain of blood leaves an impression which can never be effaced in the midst of the conflicting opinions of the writers of antiquity what appears most probable is that water-mills were invented in asia minor and that they were not really used in rome till the reign of honorius and arcadius under the rule of emperor justinian when the goths besieged the roman city the celebrated belisarius thought of constructing some on the tiber the means which he employed were simple and ingenious two boats firmly fixed at two feet distance from each other caused the stream to give a rapid motion to the hydraulic wheel suspended by its axle between these two lateral points of support and this wheel turned the mills the system differed but little from that of vitruvius which he described more than five centuries before and is explained in a few words a little wheel fixed to the axle of the hydraulic wheel turned a third wheel adhering to the axle of the upper grindstone and the corn fell between the two stones in passing from the hopper placed above these grindstones were made of a kind of porous lava which retained its roughness or rather its roughness was renewed by the continual friction the introduction of water mills however did not prevent the use of those worked by hand which habit cheapness and facility of removal recommended these antique mills of hebrews the egyptians and the greeks of the heroic times were only five feet high each family was supplied with as many as they might require in the residence of ulysses that great king of little ithaca there were as many as twelve women turned the mills and were obliged to deliver a certain quantity of flour before leaving the task imposed on them corn was first ground in a portative hand mill by the britons women and young girls were employed in this kind of labour it is however probable that water-mills were known at a very early period in england strutt cites a passage from a charter by ulfiri in six sixty four which warrants the supposition 
it would be difficult to point out the precise date of the first employment of mills nevertheless sumner informs us in his antiquities of canterbury that the anglo-normans of that place ground their corn there was he says some time a windmill standing near the nunnery without ridinggate which the hospital held by the grant of the nuns there the conditions mutually agreed upon at the time of the grant were that the nuns bearing the fourth part of the charge of the mill should reap the fourth part of the profit of it etc and this about the reign of king john the bran was separated from the flour by means of a sieve the dough was made and sent to the bakers to be baked the poor contented themselves with cakes baked under the ashes something remains to be said of windmills we will say but little on the subject this aerial mechanism which the knight-errant don quixote of imperishable memory thought it necessary to fight with sword and lance was unknown before the christian era in any nation whose writers have transmitted to us the least traces of their civilization but nothing proves that windmills were unknown to others this opinion seems to be well founded from a passage of the chronicler winceslaus who relates in his history of bohemia that the first water-mill raised in that country was in the year of christ seven eighteen and that no other was in use before antea but mills built on the summit of mountains which were put in motion by the wind it appears then that there is some untruth in the assertion that this sort of mill was introduced into europe about the year ten forty by the first crusaders on their return from the east at all events this question is no doubt very deserving the laborious research of the learned it has but a secondary interest for the gastrophilist it matters little to him whether he owes the grinding of his corn to the breath of a zephyr or to the slimy source of a river all he requires is good flour because it enters into a great number of culinary preparations and first of all bread is made from it End of section 3section four of pantrophian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pantrophian by alexis sawyer manipulation of flour man has not always eaten fine wheaten bread biscuits or sponge cakes and for many centuries the inexperience of his palate prevented his imagining or understanding those magiric combinations that science of good living which requires time and serious study nature makes us hungry art creates modifies and directs the appetite these are incontestable truths which this work will solve to unfold and if necessary to prove should any of our readers unfortunately not be already convinced of the depth of these wise axioms let us go no further back than the year two thousand before the christian era and enter together the tent of the father of nations abraham we might lead you to the fireside of each of the nineteen patriarchs who preceded him but that would take us too far in the interior of this nomad dwelling sarah the venerable companion of the pastor king has just prepared with flour and water round pieces of flattened paste which she places on the hearth and covers afterwards with hot ashes. It was thus that princes and servants made bread in the east. The Jewish people who inhabited the desert ate no other kind, and the prophet Elijah, reposing under the shade of a juniper tree, appeased his hunger with this simple and primitive food. Sometimes, however, at certain periods of solemnity, the Hebrews used a gridiron placed on the coals or a frying pan into which they put the paste but these various modes of cooking produced a kind of cake dry thin and brittle somewhat like the jewish passover cake which was broken by the hand without the aid of a knife they were called lechem choice and chief food and the mother of the family generally renewed them each day the inhabitants of the east thought so much of bread that it was considered a special mark of regard and hospitality to the person to whom it was offered boaz says to ruth at meal-time come thou hither 
and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar although the use of bread without leaven and baked under the ashes was common among the jews it is nevertheless evident that they knew and employed at an early period some substance to raise the dough which they designated by the manner of seor it was perhaps flour diluted with water left to get sour pliny assures us that of all means employed by the ancients to render bread savoury and light this is the most simple and easy it appears not unlikely that the hebrews learned from the egyptians how to prepare the leaven they made use of the period at which an allusion is made to it for the first time in the bible renders this supposition likely it is when the people of god were about to escape from the slavery of the egyptians and are preparing to celebrate the passover on the eve of their setting out for the desert the israelites therefore knew how to make bread more digestive and of better taste than is generally believed not so good perhaps as our delicate fancy bread but better than the clumsy lumps of paste baked under the ashes in the frying pan or on the gridiron they had also ovens at a very distant period of their history some four thousand years ago these ovens were made with bricks or clay afterwards they used iron and brass but nothing in the holy writings shows us that any one exercised among them the trade of baker at least at this early period nor indeed very much later the chief baker or butler whose punishment and death joseph foretold when he interpreted that officer's dream was an egyptian and belonged to king pharaoh hitherto an infallible book has been our guide let us now dive into the dark and almost boundless regions of fabulous antiquity the most frightful god of which the fevered imagination of man could possibly form an idea a god with the face and legs of a goat the horrible pan according to some credulous writers taught mortals the art of making and baking bread the name even of this food they say furnishes an incontestable proof of this assertion you are mistaken reply more sensible writers it is in the greek word pan signifying all that we must seek the etymology of this nutritious substance which accompanies all other aliments takes their place if needful and agrees equally with all mankind this one would think is conclusive but the learned the philologist and every procrustes of literature protests against a halt with so fair a field before him it is from the word pascere proudly exclaims another interpreter that the substantive bread is derived this word has been rather disfigured on its way think of the length of time it has been travelling down to us ceres taught the greeks how to cultivate corn they learned from megalate and megalamaze how to knead flour and bake it in ovens the gratitude of the boeotians erected statues and altars to their memories and shortly after greece could boast of having obtained the most skilful bakers in the world the bread of athens and megara had a well-deserved reputation its whiteness dazzled the eye and its taste was exquisite this voluptuous and fickle nation very soon began to tire of so intelligent and simple a manipulation and must needs mix with the paste a host of ingredients which greatly altered its flavour and seventy-two different sorts of bread took birth from the scientific association of milk oil honey cheese and wine with the best flour all these varieties were called by the generic name of artos bread to which was added an epithet which prevented the mistaking of one kind for another the bread market at athens was very amusing women for the fair sex busied themselves with this trade waited seated by the side of their baskets until mercury should send them customers and woe to those who came late or whose evil genius led them to find fault with either the quality quantity or price of the goods have you ever heard the ladies of billingsgate playing off their pleasant jokes on a timid countryman or a foreigner whose accent had betrayed him it is a running fire of puns and crude picturesque expressions which nothing can resist our greek market women would have been more than a match for them can we bestow upon them greater praise some of them sold azumos 
a delicate sort of biscuit, but rather tasteless, prepared without leaven. Others, irresistible sirens, invited children to taste of the relishing artologanos, in which a renowned baker had the talent of introducing wine, pepper, oil, and milk. Here the sparkling eyes of a rich epicurean were on the lookout for some escarites, a very light paste seasoned with new sweet wine and honey, and which was relished even by fatigued appetites at the close of a repast. The poorer people made their choice among heaps of dolires or typhies. They were coarse compounds of rye and barley. The ladies of fashion, petite maîtresse, preferred the puff cakes called placite, or the sweet melitutes, whose exquisite and perfumed flower was delicately kneaded with the precise honey of Mount Hymettus. Lastly, the robust workmen of the Piraeus brought the Tyrontes, bread mixed with cheese, which the higher classes of society in Athens abhorred, and which even the middling classes excluded from their tables. Let us add to this the imperfect enumeration that the Greeks baked their bread in several different manners, some in ovens, others under ashes, over charcoal, or between two pieces of iron, similar to our gaufre moulds, and under a bell or cover of some metal, with a rim round the top and fire over it. For making a batch of bread, they employed nine pounds six ounces of leaven to twelve bushels of flour. With regard to their ovens, in the construction of which they excelled, they always took particular care to place them near a handmill in order that the various processes that the wheat had to undergo should take place with ease and promptitude. The Romans for a long time, paltifagists, or eaters of gruel, etc., and it would be difficult to ascertain with accuracy the precise period at which they gave a preference to bread. They no doubt knew of it before the year 365 of Rome, for at the siege of the capital by the Gauls, Jupiter, who protected the besieged, thought of nothing better to get them out of their difficulties than to appear at night to their general, Manlius, and to give him the following advice. Make, said he, bread with all the flour you have left in store, and throw it to the enemy to show them that Rome has no apprehension of being reduced by famine. This stratagem, worthy of a merry Andrew, pleased Manlius so much that he immediately put it into execution, the Gauls fled, Master Jupiter was highly delighted with the trick he had played, and thereby the Romans got rid of this swarm of barbarians. Whether this story be true or not, the people of Romulus had a decided taste for gruel. It was a national dish, and was only discontinued to be given to the soldiers, defenders of the Republic, when it was perceived that their laborious duties required more substantial food. The Romans made their gruel of all kinds of flour. King Numa, 1715 BC, guided by the advice of the nymph Egeria, taught his subjects the art of parching corn, or converting it into flour by means of mortars, and of making that gruel with which he liked to regale himself. This good prince was rather fond of interfering in what did not concern him, and the royal compound was afterwards cooked in the public bakehouses which the piety of the sovereign placed under the protection of the powerful Fornax, a goddess unknown till then, and who soon became the object of general and fervent worship. There is but one step from gruel to bread. The Romans perceived it. Thus this favourite dish lost its reputation, and the worship of Fornax somewhat cooled. But, on the other hand, there was still the smell of cakes on all sides, cooking on the hearth, on the coals, in the small bell-stoves, and in large baking pans, until ultimately they became acquainted with the use of ovens. At last Rome began to have them built, under the reign of Tarquinius Superbus, about 630 years before the Christian era. They were solid constructions, immovable, and very like those of the present day. Men were employed to keep up the necessary degree of heat, and their useful profession, thanks to the strange caprices which so tyrannically ruled the social hierarchy, became one of the vilest and most sordid occupations in the capital of the world. These ovens were ordered to be built far away from all edifices, in order to prevent accidents by fire. 
an excellent precaution where so many incautious and merry old gossips came daily to bake their bread once there those worthy plebeians amused themselves by giving full scope to their noisy fun slandering their neighbours freely and charitably telling each other all the little scandal they had picked up here and there among the good souls in the neighbourhood hence these public places of labour and incessant babbling were called the gossip bakehouses these joyous meetings continued until the arrival of greek bakers a hundred and seventy years b c who followed the victorious armies of the republic on their return from macedonia these new operatives effected a complete revolution in the art of making bread they reformed the taste of their masters and by degrees the proverbial frugality of the conquerors of the universe gave way to the exquisite researches and wonderful delicacies of those whom they had subdued the romans perceived the importance of perpetuating the talent of these strangers and converting it eventually into a national industry with these views they gave them roman colleagues and subsequently they were formed into a college or sort of association which no member could quit on any pretext whatever the son followed his father's profession and he who married the daughter of a baker became one himself sometimes one of these privileged artisans was raised to the dignity of senator as an honour to his colleagues but in that case he was required to abandon his fortune to the person who took his place he might however decline the dignity and remain at his kneading trough all alliances with gladiators and comedians were interdicted them and the law decreed that the delinquent guilty of such dishonour should be first scourged then banished and that his property should be confiscated for the benefit of the community finally the prodigal baker was assimilated with the dishonest bankrupt and expelled the college the above details on some of the dispositions of the law regarding this interesting corporation sufficiently prove the importance that the roman government attached to it and wished it should always maintain the bakers of rome received from the public granaries whatever they required at a price fixed by the magistrate if the officer charged with the distribution of it gave a bad quality or exacted a bribe to supply good corn that officer was disgraced and he became for ever a journeyman baker independently of public bakeries the number of which reached three hundred and twenty nine under the reign of augustus there were also in the houses of the wealthy slaves whose sole occupation was the making of bread and these slaves brought an exorbitant price when they excelled in their art they used portable ovens made of iron or earthenware under which they placed red-hot coals sometimes they employed a round brass vessel with a cover which was put under the flames in the houses where the greatest luxury reigned they had a kind of silver mould from which the bread was taken and served to the guests it is absolutely necessary to dive into the private life of the roman people and not to neglect any of their domestic customs accounts of which are scattered here and there in the writings of the more serious historians and among the dangerous frivolities of certain poets if we wish to have a correct idea of the excessive refinement which the opulent classes evinced even in the most ordinary things modern nations are satisfied with the bread more or less white and even bear without much complaint certain illicit mixtures in which various heterogeneous substances are sometimes strangely amalgamated but this was not the case in rome the prefect of provisions praefectus anonai was scrupulously careful to see that the supply of bread was abundant that it was of exact weight that the manipulation of it was excellent and that it was made of the best flour the public granaries contained as we have already observed that was one of the most serious cares of the government on behalf of a people who only required two things bread and the circus and whose ferocity when pressed by hunger knew no bounds they studied carefully every modification that the art of baking might seem to require they examined the leaven in use and experimented with new kinds the following are the compositions pliny has transmitted to us the romans sought much of millet for their leaven they mixed it with sweet wine in which they let it ferment a year they employed also wheat bran soaked for three days in sweet white wine 
and dried in the sun of this they diluted a certain quantity at the time of making bread which was left to ferment in the best wheat flour and afterwards mixed with the entire mass the leavens just mentioned were made during the vintage the rest of the year they were replaced by the following a dish containing two pounds of barley paste was placed on red hot coals and heated until ebullition commenced it was put into vessels till it became sour very often leaven was procured from dough just made a piece was taken from the mass previous to salt being added it was then left to turn sour and might be used the next day the celebrated naturalist who supplies these details tells us that in his time the gauls and spaniards after having made a drink from wheat saved the scum to raise the dough and that their bread was the lightest of all it will be difficult to form an idea of the prodigious luxury which rome introduced into an aliment so common and of such universal use as bread its name its form and flavour indicated the various ranks of society to which it belonged there was the senator's bread that of the knights of the citizens of the people and that of the peasants let us go together under the vast galleries supported by those magnificent arcades the ediles have preceded us they are visiting the shops it is the forum pistrinum or bread market the year is good a septier five bushels of wheat is only twenty-five shillings and provisions of all kinds abound in rome foreigners also are here attracted by curiosity for vespasian is preparing to deposit with solemnity the spoils of jerusalem in the temple of peace in the middle of the enclosure you see the statue of vesta the goddess worshipped by bakers in the front and round the gallery those open stalls are loaded with a number of round loaves of the same form and weight they are all five inches in thickness the top is divided by eight notches that is to say they are first divided across and the four parts are again subdivided these lines are made in the dough so that they may be more easily broken the roman gentry and shopkeepers give the preference to this sort of household bread simply composed of flour water and salt you perceive here and there several baskets full of heavy biscuits they are called autopyron it is a coarse black food composed of bran mixed with a little flour and made expressly for the dogs and slaves do you see that colossal looking man with enormous limbs who is walking about with an air of stupidity and whose small head is covered with scars the dealers know his profession and one of them offers him the athletos bread it is kneaded without leaven with soft white curd cheese and is a coarse heavy food which that class of people seem to partake of with great delight that stout baker before us occupies two of the most spacious shops in the market on the left of the statue he is one of the richest members of the corporation and is the principal purveyor for the camp and army those large sacks placed before him with so much symmetry contain the buccellatum biscuit or dried bread for the troops his neighbour called the greek was born in athens he is the fashionable purveyor to the princes senators and sybarites of rome no one understands so well as himself the art of mixing salt oil and milk with the best wheat and flour an exquisite combination which produces the celebrated bread of cappadocia served only on the tables of the wealthy with the artoplites a light bread made with the best wheat and flour and baked in a mould it is the only kind of which refined persons can partake if we were not afraid of tiring you we could point out many other sorts of bread which abound in the forum pistrinum for there is some for all tastes and classes from the artopticiae baked in moulds a most nutritious and digestive bread down to the furfuraceus a mass of indigestible bran that the wildest savages among the scythians could not have swallowed with impunity we should have spoken to you of the astrologicus bread the paste of which is similar to that we use in our days to make fritters commonly called batter also of the cacabaceus which is indebted for its agreeable and spicy flavour to the water which is previously boiled in a kind of bronzed stewpan 
and the siligenius bread made of the best flour its manipulation is difficult and tedious no matter the epicurean prefers it when by chance he happens to be hungry neither ought we to forget the panis madidas a species of paste made of milk and flour from which the fashionable ladies and effeminate dandies covered their faces before going to bed to preserve the freshness and beauty of their complexion but this enumeration may appear to you idle and endless let us therefore leave the market and assist at the distribution of bread civilis among the people of which thirteen ounces is given to each person we will then give a rapid glance at the various other cereals besides wheat which in some shape or other are converted into food the customs of the middle ages cannot be better illustrated than by adding the following curious notes the norman king subjected the bakers to very severe laws with respect to the weight and price of bread the first offence was punished by the confiscation of their bread the second by a fine and the third by the pillory st louis made statutes for the bakers of paris he forbade them to bake on sunday or any festival day under pain of a fine of eighteen sous about eighteen pence and a certain quantity of bread but he gave them permission to open their shops and sell every day of the year without exception in the seventeenth century a new regulation was made concerning bakers they were to bake daily and have always on sale three kinds of bread that is that known as pain de chalis of twelve ounces pain de chapitre of ten ounces and brownish household bread of sixteen ounces the price of each to be douze deniers a halfpenny marked by the baker with his own particular mark they were also permitted to make rolls and other sorts but not to expose them for sale under pain of being fined four hundred paris livres a little more than twelve pounds sterling master bakers were admitted at paris in the fourteenth century in the following manner when a young man had been successively winnower sifter kneader and foreman he could by paying a certain amount to the king as legion's money become an aspirant baker and commence business on his own account four years later he was received as master by going through certain formalities on a given day he set out from his house followed by all the bakers of the town and repaired to the residence of the master of the bakers to whom he presented a new pot filled with nuts saying master i have accomplished my four years here is my pot of nuts then the master of the bakers asked the secretary of the trade whether that were true and having received a reply in the affirmative the master of the bakers returned the pot to the aspirant who broke it against the wall and was at once reckoned amongst the masters let us reckon up the different kinds of bread that were in use at that epoch the bread made simply with flour water salt and yeast the common bread the best was made at chai or gonesse the bread cooked in hot water pain et chaudé in england we should call it baked dumpling the bread made of the finest flour beaten a long time with two sticks pounded bread the bread made of the very finest and purest flour biscuit flour slightly baked roll bread the bread made of fine flour kneaded with butter and sprinkled with whole wheat sheep bread the bread made of fine flour eggs and milk christmas bread and lastly rye bread kneaded with spice honey or sugar gingerbread End of section four. Section number five of Pantrophian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alex Soyer. Frumentia. Do not be alarmed, fair readers, at the Latin noun which heads this chapter. Tolerate it in consideration of our promise seldom to solicit a like favor. It meant, among 
the latins all the plants which produce ears of corn the seeds of which can be converted into flour clearly there never was a more innocent expression barley seems to claim the first place among cereals of the second order the greeks looked upon it as the happy symbol of fertility and the ancient inhabitants of italy gave it a name hordium which perhaps recalled to their mind the use mankind made of it before wheat was known ex ordium the jews had a great esteem for barley and sacred history generally assimilates it to wheat when the fruits of the earth are mentioned thus a beloved spot produces both plants shobi offered to david wheat and barley and solomon promises twenty thousand sacks of wheat and as much barley to the workmen charged with cutting down the cedars of lebanon the greeks and romans did not carry their love for this grain so far as the hebrews in rome it was the food of the flocks and cowards in lacedaemon and at athens the gladiators and common people had no other element they made it into barley gruel alpheton the composition of which was very simple and would not probably tempt a modern lucillus here is the recipe of this ancient and national dish dry near the fire or in the oven twenty pounds of barley flour then parch it add three pounds of linseed meal half a pound of coriander seed two ounces of salt and the quantity of water necessary to this mixture of ingredients the italian epicureans added a little millet so as to give the paste more cohesion and delicacy this culinary preparation must appear rather unworthy of those nations who so completely eclipsed all the gastronomic glories of the universe wherefore let us hasten to reinstate them as men of taste and exquisite intelligence by citing a more learned combination which obtained the judicious patronage of the archistrates and apici take pearl barley pound it in a mortar make use of the flour only and put it in a saucepan pour on it by degrees some of the best oil with that certainty which science alone gives to the hand and stir it carefully whilst a slow equal fire performs the great work of cookery be above all attentive to enrich it at proper intervals with a delicate gravy extracted from a young fat chicken or from a succulent lamb unceasingly watch lest the abulsion by going on too rapidly force this delightful mixture to overflow the side of the vessel and when your practised palate informs you that it is worthy of your guests present it to their impatient sensuality so it appears the ancients were acquainted with pearl barley and barley water the latter took the name of diet drink psanta which we only associate with melancholy reminiscences hippocrates was not only in raptures with the virtues and properties of this element but he also conferred the highest praise on that sweet and insipid drink which our doctors order their patients as did the oracle of cause and which at that time was called barley broth oats occupied an honourable place after barley pliny fancied these two plants so analogous that the owner of a field who had sown barley might find oats at the time of harvest whilst precisely the reverse might happen to his neighbour nature in our days is not subject to such frolics and our farmers are tolerably certain that by care labor and god's assistance they will gather from the soil what they have sown in order to develop a strong flavor of vanilla in black oats wash the seed 
boil it a moment in water and employ the decoction as you would potato flour and it will form excellent creams in normandy and lower brittany they make with flour of oats a delicious soup the following is the manner they obtain it they take white oats and put them in the oven when sufficiently dried they are fanned cleaned and carried to mill the grinders of which are freshly sharpened the miller takes care to hold them a little way off in order they may not crush the grain and that this last may preserve the shape of rice by this means they remove the whole of the pedicle the greeks and romans knew how to appreciate oatmeal they used it to make a kind of gruel such as we already described and also a substantial thick milk which they prepared as we do rice was also held in great esteem by them they considered it as a food very beneficial to the chest therefore it was recommended in cases of consumption and to persons subject to spitting of blood millet so called from the multiplicity of its seeds abounded more particularly in gaul in the time of strabo pliny pretends that no grain swells so much in cooking and he assures us that sixty pounds of bread was obtained from a single bushel of millet weighing only twenty pounds this naturalist also speaks of another kind of millet coming originally from india and which had only been in cultivation ten years in italy the stalk resembled that of the reed and often attained the height of ten feet its fecundity was such that a single grain produced innumerable ears of corn therefore if so prolific and capable of making good and economical food why should it not be in eighteen fifty eight cultivated largely wherever the climate may allow it some writers place panic grass among the wheats because certain nations make bread of it the higher classes of rome and athens always resisted this bad taste they preferred spelt or red wheat a super excellent grain which was much honored by the latins if we can credit the charming letter written by pliny the younger to septius clarus on the occasion of a dinner where the latter failed to join the guests among other delicate dishes with which he desired to treat his friend he had ordered a spelt cake to be made this same flour was the base of the carthanagan pudding which the reader may taste if he will here is the recipe carthanaginian pudding put a pound of red wheat flour into water when it is soaked some time place it in a wooden bowl add three pounds of cream cheese half a pound of honey and one egg beat this mixture well together and cook it on a slow fire in a stew pan should this dish not be sufficiently delicate try the following when you have sifted some spelt flour put it in a wooden vessel with some water which you must renew twice a day for ten days at the end of that time squeeze out all the water and place the paste in another vessel reduce it to the consistence of thick lees pass it through a piece of new linen and repeat this last operation draw it in the sun and then boil it in milk as regards the exact seasoning of this exquisite roman dish it is your own genius which must inspire you with the proportions let us not omit to notice the erupon of the greeks the irion of the latins the indian wheat of the moderns this plant produces a wholesome and easily digestible food it was well known in italy in the time of pliny at which period the peasants used to make a crisp sort of heavy bread probably somewhat similar to that which is still used in the south of france 
since the famine of 1847 great attention has been paid to this flower much was imported into england from america where it is used in domestic economy when green its milky pulp is an excellent food the various advantages of this flower however are not sufficiently developed to give all the benefit of its goodness to the world habit and prejudice assist materially to prevent its being generally employed the romans also ate it as a hasty pudding parched or roasted with a little salt a writer equally remarkable for his elegant and easy style as well as for the justness of his observations informs us that in our days the indian inhabitants of the unfruitful plains of marwar never dress indian corn any other way such are the principal gramina which the ancients thought worthy of their attention or allowed to appear on their tables with more or less honor according to the degree of esteem in which they were held it is probable that the cooks in the great gastronomic period of rome and athens who knew so well the capricious nature of their masters palates had to borrow from magiric chemistry then so flourishing some wonderful means of giving to various kinds of cereals a culinary value they now no longer possess what might we not expect from a thimbron a mythoceus a stockardes this latter performed a feat which does him too much honor to be unnoticed here the king of bithynia nicomedes was taken with a strange invincible and imperious longing which admitted of no delay he ordered his cook stokertes to be sent for and commanded him to prepare instantly a dish of loaches loaches sire cried the skilful yet terrified cook by all the gods protectors of the kingdom where can i procure these fish at this late hour of the night kings ill brook resistance to their will nicomedes was not celebrated for patience when pressed by hunger give me loaches i say replied he with a hollow and terrible voice or else and his clear fearful pantomimic expression made the unfortunate cook understand too well that he must either obey or immediately deliver up his head to the provost of the palace the alternative was embarrassing nevertheless socrates thought how to get out of the scrape he shut himself up in his laboratory peeled some long radishes and with extraordinary address gave them the form of the fatal fish seasoning them with oil salt black pepper and doubtless several other ingredients the secret of which the illustrious chef has not handed down to posterity then holding in his hand a dish of irreproachable looking fried fish he boldly presented himself before the prince who was walking up and down with hasty strides awaiting his arrival the king of the bithynians ate up the whole and the next day he condescended to inform his court that he never had loaches served he so much liked this digression which the reader will kindly pardon sufficiently shows to what height the art of ancient cookery was carried and of which this work will furnish new and abundant proofs the cereals having had so much of our attention we have now to consider these grains or seeds which serve as the bases or necessary adjuncts to different dishes end of section five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c